welcome to Let's Talk Near Death, the podcast show that talks about life, death, and experiences somewhere in between. I'm Kirsty Salisbury, the host of the show, and I hope you'll join me as I chat to everyday people with not-so-everyday experiences. You may also wish to join the conversation over in the Let's Talk Near Death online community, which is found at www.letstalknearedeath.com. Membership is free, or you're welcome to upgrade to join the live VIP events, to gain early access to episodes, or to receive extra VIP bonus material. Your support helps me to continue to get episodes out and to help grow the conversation around these types of experiences. But before then, let's talk near death. But we decided to make a pact that the one of us who passed on first would make an effort to contact the other one, but not directly. She was completely gone. She had obviously suffered a massive heart attack or a massive stroke. I asked her, what about COVID? What's going to happen? And she said, it will not begin to be resolved until December and your world will be forever changed. Because we're here to have spontaneous experiences and to digest them. Welcome back to the Let's Talk Near Death podcast. Today, our guest is Whitley Streber who is the author of this fabulous book, The Afterlife Revolution. The Afterlife Revolution takes a very unique look at the afterlife and the things that both Whitley and his wife Anne have learnt, not only through her near-death experience, but also through Anne's passing in 2015. Whitley, I'd love to welcome you and say thank you for being here on the show. It is Wonderful to have your book here. I'd love to start by just reading some of the words on the first page of your book, just to give the listeners a bit more of a, an idea about what the book is about. So I know that listeners, you're going to love this as much as I did. So we start with, we all live with the same question. What will happen to me after I die? Will I disappear into nothingness? Or is there an afterlife? During their 45 year marriage, Anne and Whitley Streber often discussed this and wondered whether or not their love affair would have to come to an end when one of them died. In the late 1990s, they made a pact that the first one to die would try to contact the other one still on this side. How did this all start? Tell us, take us back. Where do we start this conversation? Well, it's a, you're asking me to, to, to start at the beginning of a very long road, but I will. Um, I'm glad to. Back when we were young, Anne and I were married in 1970, we were very typical Western educated, secular people. Um, we had a sort of on and off relationship with religion, most, mostly off. But we basically, if you had asked either one of us, we would have said, yes, that there is a higher level of consciousness, but I, we didn't believe necessarily in the survival of a soul. Uh, that that you could make a you could you could increase your level of consciousness in this life, yes. And we were involved in the Gurdjieff Foundation, and with the objective of doing that. And that's a foundation f- created by a Armenian philosopher called George Gurdjieff back in the 1920s, and he teaches or taught a method of expanding your attention and increasing its power in order to be more awake to your life. And so we were doing that and living our lives. And then in December of 1985, I had a very extraordinary experience happen to me, a close encounter of the third kind, as it turned out. I wrote a book about it called Communion. And this book was an enormous international bestseller. And it brought hundreds of thousands of letters to us. This was before email. And Annie read all the, these letters. Annie was a very highly organized and brilliant person. And, you know, I was just 
disappearing into heaps of mail, but she was getting it all organized with her secretary and they were reading every letter and cataloging them and so forth. This wonderful catalog of letters is now at, uh, kept as, it, it's now part of a university uh, collection at, at Rice University, which is a big university in Texas. Mm -hmm. um, and the, uh, so one day she came out of her office and she said a very surprising thing. Whitley, this has something to do with what we call death because we thought it was about contact with aliens at the time, but when it happened to me, because that's what it seemed like, but it turned out it was a much, much more complex experience. And we realized as we read the letters and reviewed what had happened to me and what ha happened to the many other people who came to our isolated little cabin in upstate New York where, we, where these in entities would show up, uh, where quite a few people had the extraordinary experience of, of meeting them there. In any case, face to face, physically. In any case, putting it all together, it seemed to very frequently that the dead would show up when or right near when these strange entities would show up. Hmm. And we thought to ourselves, is this some kind of a, something, the veil between the worlds is, uh, is, is, is thinner around them or precisely what is going on here? Hmm. And, but we decided to make a pact that the one of us who passed on first would make an effort to contact the other one, but not directly, because neither one of us would have accepted that. I would have assumed it was my imagination, and so would have mm. she. Mm. So the idea was that without telling anyone, we would, t we would, we didn't tell anybody about this pact, not even our child our son. And uh, the f idea was that the first one to pass on, if possible, would contact friends and get them to contact the one that was still in the physical world. And what you read is exactly what happened because Annie passed on 7-15, August the 11th, 2015, and at 9.30, I was sitting in my chair in the living room, just devastated. There's no way that you know, I'm sure, uh, mm. if you have an interest in this or have lost someone in your own life, how that feels. And I was saying, Annie, are you still here at all? And if you are, contact me. I had honestly forgotten all about the pact because it was something we discussed of an afternoon and, you know, for 10 minutes and forgot about. And she hadn't forgot about it, obviously. So at that moment, when I was thinking that to myself, the phone rang and it was old, a friend of ours, Belle Fuller. She had no way of knowing Anne had passed away. And she said, Whitley, I just heard Anne's voice in my ear asking me to call you. Is she all right? Oh, wow. And I wow. said, Belle, yes, she's not all right. She died at 7.15. And that was the first of what became what Dr. Gary Schwartz in the forward to our book, and Anne and I wrote it together. It's that simple. In the forward to it, he says it's among the most well-documented cases of afterlife contact that's ever existed. Mm -hmm. And if you look on the cover of the book, you see a white moth and two fingers pointing at each other with the moth between them. In January, before Annie passed away, it, months before she passed away, she began to want me to memorize a poem of W.B. Yeats called The Song of Wandering Angus. And, uh, I didn't know why, but she did. And I'm, I'm not sure on the mind level she knew why either. But it turned out to be of absolutely central importance to, our, uh, to, to what happened after her passing. Because I was at a conference about three or four months later, 
And we have a, a security system with a surveillance camera that will send you a text if it sees movement. And the surveillance camera sent a text showing there was movement in the apartment, which was quite unusual because I live alone and I don't have any pets. And it looked at, there was this white moth flying around in front of the camera. And I thought, my God, what in the world? How did a big moth get in there? And I came home and found no trace of any moth at all. There was no dead moth or live moth anywhere in the place. And so I chalked it up to a strange coincidence or some sort. Maybe the moth got out somehow, although the place was sealed up tight, so it's hard to know why. Then I was at another conference giving a speech about Annie and about our relationship, because we had developed quite a relationship by then. And suddenly, while I was giving the speech, I mentioned this strange event with the white moth. And I thought to myself, I said to, I said to the audience, I, I had the sense that it had something to do with Anne, but I could not ever identify what it was. And my phone, this, this phone went, and I opened it, and there was a text. The white moth had flown in that moment right across the camera and then just oh, disappeared. Wow. Then Christmas came, and I was with my son on Christmas Eve, and I said, you know, I think mom is around because of the, this. And I said that every time I mention her when I'm not in the house, this white moth flies across in front of the screen. And burp, there went the white moth again. And I said, well, I'm, you know, I'm a believer now. Boy, Annie is around. And I know my wife. She's, she's, she's a lovely, was a lovely woman, but she did not suffer fools gladly. So I had better get, get on the stick here and quit fooling around. And then I remembered something. I remembered that her absolute favorite story of mine, I'm a, I'm a writer of fiction as well as nonfiction, was called The White Moths. And it's a story about an old woman discovering that she has died and looking back over her life and not, not really understanding at first that she's passed on. And so I memorized the poem, the, the Song of Wandering Angus, and you'll see why. It, it goes, I went out to the hazel wood because a fire was in my head and cut and peeled a hazel wand and hooked a berry to a thread. And when white moths were on the wing and the moth-like stars were flickering out, I dropped the berry in a stream and caught a little silver trout. When I laid it on the floor and went to blow the fire aflame, something rustled on the floor and someone called me by my name. It had become a glimmering girl with apple blossom in, my, in her hair who called me by my name and faded through the brightening air. I am old with wandering in hollow lands and hilly lands but I will find where she has gone and kiss, kiss her lips and take her hands. Sorry. And take her hands. I can't complete it. I, it's it's too emotionally intense for me. I'm so it's sorry. It's fine. It's a beautiful poem. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I'm going to try and walk okay. in long dappled grass and pluck till time and times are done the silver apples of the moon, the golden apples of the sun. Here, I managed it. Made it. Well done. Thank you. So from there, oh, what, what, what happened? happened was a relationship developed because the, the two incident, incidents I talked about described of, of the white moth were only two of many dozens of incidents, most many of them involving other people. I would, the week after Annie passed away, I was sitting on a bench in a, in a, a, a at near a hotel in, in near where I live in, uh, in uh, Palm Springs, California, and thinking again the same thing, Annie, if you are anywhere, give me a sign. And my phone rang, and it was a friend from Tennessee 
who said, Whitley, I just heard Anne's voice in my head tell me to call you right away. And it went on like that and on. And finally, I learned to talk to Anne. I am not a channel. I don't know what that's about, and I don't even trust it very much. I mean, I guess it exists, and I've, but I've seen so much channeling that turned out to be completely wrong that, that I'm just not, I, I, couldn't, I, couldn't, I could not sit down and channel somebody. But I knew, knew Annie so well, and we loved each other so deeply that I do feel that when we connect with each other, it's real. And uh, uh, so we began to connect. And she began to tell me things, wonderful things that I had never thought of before about the afterlife. <clears throat> One of the first things she said was, Whitley, it looks like you're all intentionally ignoring us. And, uh, which is fascinating. Mm. And another thing she said, she was a wonderful teacher in her life and loved to teach. And a lot of it has been very oriented toward teaching. Uh, one another thing she said uh, is that um, uh, uh, enlightenment is what happens when there is nothing left of us but love, which is an you know as a, it, we always look to privation and and sacrifice and whatnot to get enlightenment, but it's a much more down to earth and human vision of enlightenment. That, that we could find a path in ourselves so deep and so truly human that there would be nothing left of us but love. And I thought to myself when I heard her say that, boy, what a life aim my wife has just given me. This is my aim for the rest of my life, to work at this. Mm. It's not easy. Mm. I mean, every time I open the newspaper, I'm ready, ready to have to start over again from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of us relate to that. And it's so interesting to hear the words of love coming through. This is something that comes up time and time again, and yes. that it's about love. So I would love to know, at what point did the communication, because you said the communication was going not directly because it was that was going to be too hard, you'd doubt yourself. Yeah. It was an emotional process. Obviously, you're in the thick of grief while this is happening. How did that transition from going through other, other people, through the phone, through the moth being on the security camera? It was, it was the white moth that started that. When, when I realized that Anne was showing me the white moth intentionally and therefore going back to the short story and the poem she'd had me memorize, I knew it was Anne. I remember her first word, and I said, Annie, can you hear me? And she said, finally. I said, I'm sorry. I, and she said, don't be sorry, honey. You have your own way, and it's hard to, to do for you. I know that. But there were many other extraordinary things that Anne did. Uh, she, uh, for example... Uh, there is a, I just had on my own podcast, Dreamland, um, a lady called uh, Cherylee Black, uh, who um, is a, uh, uh, not a psychic, but she sees a lot of dead people. And she began seeing this ghost of a woman. She'd, and she had never even heard of me at this point, Cherylee. And uh, she saw the ghost so often that she drew a picture of her. But she didn't know what to do with it until one day, a book written that I co-authored with a friend, Jeffrey Kripal, who is also, he's a friend of Cheryl Lee's. She was thinking about who could this be and how can I find out? And suddenly the book flew off the shelf and landed at her feet. Wow. And she thought, well, I'll call Jeff. She didn't know me or how to get a hold of me at all. And so she called Jeff and sent her, her, him her drawing. And Jeff is a sweet guy, but he's a guy, basically. And he, he didn't recognize the face at all. 
even though he had known Anne. And uh, so he asked, he, Shirley kind of was persistent with him, you know, well, maybe someone else knows her because it's got something to do with you. I know it does, or that, would, that wouldn't have happened with the book. So he sent it to another friend of ours, another author, Diana Pasilka, and uh, Diana recognized it immediately. Diana said, Jeff, that's Ann Streber. And so Jeff sent it to me. And of course, I recognized not only instantly, not only was it Ann, but it was a, a based on a photograph of Ann that was private at the time. It wasn't uh, present in the public at all. And wow. the two faces are exactly alike. It, it is absolutely extraordinary. And, but there was even more to the picture. When we were young, Annie and I used to enjoy on Sundays on the, in the New York Times, the theater section, which is gone now, alas. But in the theater section, uh, there was an artist called Hirschfeld who would draw caricatures of the stars each week. And he had a sort of flowing hand. And he would conceal the name of his daughter, Nina, in his drawings. And at the, at the, right down at the bottom of each drawing, there would be his name, Hirschfeld, and a number. And that was the number of Ninas in the drawing. And the fun thing was to find them all on Sunday morning while you were having your late brunch or coffee. Annie was very good at finding them, and she always beat me. There are 21 Anns in the drawing. And Shirley had no idea she was even doing that when she drew the picture. She had no idea. But there are 21 separate places where the word Ann appears inside the, the, the sketch. Oh, that is amazing. It's wow. amazing. It is amazing. And Annie is a, she's still with us and she's not only with us, but she's a, a powerful presence. And over the past few years, uh, she has occasionally managed to get through to me in such a way that I can, she had a, on our website, which is called unknowncountry.com, she had a diary called Anne's Diary, which she kept for many years. And uh, she still keeps it now using me on the fairly rare occasions, which manage, I manage it once or twice a year to be able to do this. And when I, when I say do this, I mean, I suddenly feel her presence very strongly and I can hear her talking. And if I listen, it'll be a diary entry. And I want to read the one that just came uh, on December the 2nd because I think it's in many ways the finest of them, and it is certainly very beautiful. Thank you. This is a diary about inner peace. Everyone has inner peace, only we build a kind of shell around it. This shell is made up of fear and hate, but it's a very brittle shell, and you can break through it. You break through it by remembering your heart. Remember what your heart was like when you were 10 years old, open and willing. Whitley talks about real will all the time when he works with people, but this kind of will, the will of a child, is more real than the will of persistence and determination that he talks about. This is what Jesus means when he says, be as little children, because it is innocent, and innocent will is like the will of God. So when you break through that shell that has been created in you by all the negativity that bombards us from every direction, and you find that place of peace within, it is just as fresh in you as it was when you were a little child. The whole journey of enlightenment starts with admitting that you are no longer a child, but that the path to a new childhood is open. This path is a path to what I call a mature childhood, that is to say, innocence that accepts experience. I've got more to say, but I can't say it in words. When you recover your innocence, you will know what I did not say and could not say. It will be part of you, for it belongs to every heart. 
It is very ancient and goes all the way back to a very basic discovery that caused all creation. It was the discovery that the universe wasn't there. The instant that was felt, that absence, everything began. The heart of the matter was there before anything began. You can find that in yourself. The original seed of love is still inside you. So step out of the maze of confusion that is daily life and find your heart at the beginning of the world. That's Annie. That's my wife. Wow. Oh, thank you. There is so much in that, isn't there? I was thinking, gee, there's yeah. so much in this, and then there'd be more and more, so many different levels. Yeah. Thank you well, for sharing that. Anyone who wants to print it out or keep it or read it again can go to unknowncountry.com and uh, go to Anne's diary under blogs. It's very simple and it's free. Oh, fantastic. I think we'll probably put a link to that in our Facebook page as well so people can access that there. Whitley, I'd love to know, you said that you can communicate with her now. So in what form does that happen? Is that through you have thoughts come into your head? Is it when you sit down and take time to try and connect with her? Do you see her? What does that look like for you, that connection point? Sometimes she will actually almost be almost physically present. I can, I can feel her. She has kissed me. I have had, it's terribly difficult to talk about these, that part of it because it's mm -hmm. so moving when it happens. But mostly it's, in the mind and um well like for example now i can hear her now saying witty calm down calm down i'm right here and you know the thing is she is probably right here but i've only we've only got one body and so it doesn't feel like that to me when i realized how close she was i decided that i would wear both rings which you can see her ring on my small uh, finger yeah. and my ring beside it to symbolize the fact that we're still a marriage and it's still going. It's just down to one body. <laughs> so she says, now that's better. You lighten it up. People don't like to hear all of that emotional storm and drum. Oh, oh, that's funny. Yeah. And so you said something very interesting a little bit back when you said, Oh, gee, I can't even put the correct words there. But you were referring to that we as the living in this realm are ignoring them. Yes, yes. She said that one of the first things she said to that was to me that I really heard was, it looks from here, it looks like you're all intentionally ignoring us. Yeah, because of course, I've heard that so many times. It's have not the you? first time I've heard this, this concept of the people well, I guess spirit, believe that we're ignoring them. I've heard it within near-death experiences where people are trying to connect with their loved ones or connect with people on the physical realm, and it's almost like they're ignoring them. But we're, we're not engaged in that. We, we aren't tuned into it, are we? So, Well, we're here doing something else. And what it is, I've understood this, I think, fairly clearly. We're going through the time stream. We're here to have new experiences. And as soon as you step out of this, uh, you, you have a much broader vision. You don't know all of the future and all of the past because the future is not determined. We do have free will, but you can see more of it. Like when uh, in September of 2016, before the last election, I asked Dan who would win. And at the time, it seemed like there was no hope for Donald Trump. And she said, Trump. And I thought, oh, my God. And it happened. Now, last um, February, I asked her, what about COVID? What's going to happen? Hi, Kirsty here. Just interrupting this episode, just to do a little shout out, really. A huge thank you to our VIP supporters, to our VIP super supporters. In particular this month, I want to acknowledge Anna Ormsby. Thank you for jumping in. I have loved our emails back and forth, getting to know you a bit better, sharing a little bit more about me. 
And just to say thank you, Anna, because your support as a super supporter, the highest tier of support, means so much to me. For everybody else, just a reminder that there are extra live sessions which we hold over on YouTube, also via the Let's Talk Near Death Facebook page. These happen usually on a Sunday evening around about 6pm Eastern Time. It's all dependent on how often I can fit them in. So they're not regular, they're not every week. However, I am trying to get more and more of them in there. So that's another way that you can find value out of the podcast. I look forward to bringing more and more amazing stories from amazing guests. But in the meantime, let's get back to this episode. I asked her, what about COVID? What's going to happen? And she said, it will not begin to be resolved until December and your world will fe- be forever changed. And it's oh, wow. December and the vir- the vaccines are going uh-huh. out and the U.S. election is apparently over at last. It, things do, do seem to be finally starting to settle down, even though mm-hmm. we are at least in the United States in the middle of a, an absolute catastrophe with people dying in their thousands every day. Mm. You're very lucky to live where you do and to be a citizen of a, that country. I know. I feel so incredibly lucky. And, you know, I have gratitude every day. I wake up and I think I'm so lucky. I'm so grateful. Yes, and my you heart have goes reason out to, to be. everybody. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Can you take us back a little bit? I understand that Anne had a near-death experience. Yes. What was this, the circumstances surrounding that and how did that all take place? And do you think that her experience either opened up her ability to be able to connect with you now or did it trigger the conversation in the first place? What is the part that the near-death experience played in this story? Anne understood the afterlife, issues of afterlife very well because of all she had done, on, all the work she had done on the communion letters. But when, in, in October of 2004, we were walking into an, our apartment in Los Angeles, and she suddenly said, Whitley, I need your help. And I looked over, and she was buckling. I grabbed her and took her down to the floor, because her head would have hit hard otherwise. And she was completely gone. She had obviously suffered a massive heart attack or a massive stroke. I immediately telephoned EMS and telephoned my son. And there began a journey that lasted six weeks of hospitalization and rehabilitation and struggle, during which Anne had a near-death experience, and a very Anne near-death experience. There was no big white light or anything. She ended up in a bus station. (laughs) And everyone in the bus station had big packages, and they were all waiting Anne didn't have any packages, and she heard a, a voice. No, she, yeah, let, yeah, she saw our, our Siamese cat, Ko, who I see the dead a lot. And, and he had, Ko had come back after he died to the apartment, and I had been able to, to take him in the non physical level and turn him and move him in the direction of his new life. And I've done that to a lot of people also. Uh, so anyway, uh, Ko showed up and he was very condescending toward her because she, she didn't even know how to find her way in the world of the dead is how she put it. But then a voice as she moved on and she was going, said, you don't have to, you can go back. And she thought about me and about our son and his young fiance and they hadn't gotten married yet and they were just going to get married. And uh, she decided to come back. And so she did. And there was this enormous struggle to get her back to, because she almost, it was a real near death experience. They told me at the hospital on the second day that she probably wouldn't make it through the night. And she was in a deep coma, but, she did come back and she came back and then eventually had no deficits at all. She came back completely Mm -hmm. and got to enjoy her son's uh, marriage and the birth of his first two children 
and mm-hmm. to see the little family that she had worked so cr- hard to create th- start to thrive. And then in 2015, uh, 2013, uh, that little brain that had been through so much got cancer. And that we could not save her from. But she did have a near-death experience and was not in any way afraid of death. When mm-hmm. she made the decision in 2015 to go, she did not have to. She could have lived another probably three to six months, but it would have been under in, in, a, in a state of continual physical decline. And uh, her worry was that she would decline into a state where she couldn't make decisions on her own. And then I would be, I would have no choice but to, to, uh, I, I, I wouldn't be able to make a decision for her about dying. So I would just have had to let her slowly go. And that could have been a very unpleasant and difficult thing. So she said in July, July the 28th, she said, Whitty, I'm ready to go. And she did. She stopped eating and drinking and hospice came in. And in this country, what she did was completely legal. And they helped her by giving her morphine so that she wouldn't feel the pain of thirst and hunger. And it took about a week. And during that time, she gradually slept more and more. But she was always so full of wisdom and joy, always. My wife died a conscious death. My wife was what they call a master, but she was a very humble master. She said, never trust gurus who say they're gurus because they're not gurus. <laughs> but she, just, she was the real deal. Mm. Were you with her when she died at that moment? Absolutely. I, I was sitting in the living room, in the din- d- dining room with my daughter-in-law and son, and I suddenly heard her in my head, her voice as clear as day, say, Whitty, I'm dying right now. She was in the bedroom around the corner. I ran in. I lay down on the bed beside her. I put my hand on her heart, and it beat about four or five more times and stopped. That's... Mm-hmm. I, my hand was on her heart when she died. Yeah. It was the most oh. incredible blessing anyone could have would to be called like that at that moment. Mm. Oh gosh. Thank you. My heart is going out to you and I'm so loving that you're sharing this with us. So I know this has got to be very, very difficult for you. So thank you for that. Well, thank you. Your communication with her now that continues, I don't know whether it's just me, but there must have been some really big questions that you've asked her. Do you get the feeling that she has the understanding to everything? Is it that once we leave this world, could you ask her any question and she would have an answer for it? Not necessarily. She, She, well, she's, um, she's pretty advanced, I think. I'm not so sure. I'm sure she's, everyone is always still learning, but um, like, you know, she doesn't know that much about the future. And in the book, she talks about how the future comes into focus a little bit more clearly for them because they can see more, but how if, if it came into focus that way for us, it would ruin our reason for being alive because we're here to have spontaneous experiences and to digest them and, and make them part of our souls. That's what we're here for. And when, as soon as you leave here, as far as she's, I can understand from her, you see your whole life in incredible, extraordinary detail. And you, you, you can go back through it and make, get the energy of that life. And if you've lived a good life, there'll be a lot of energy, a lot of love, and a lot of things you would want. But also, one of the important things she said early on was, Whitley, I am not Anne anymore, but I'll always be Anne for you. And if you think about it, if we reincarnate, then there's someone else back there somewhere who is projecting all of these people into the world. I mean, if Anne's reincarnated many times, who did the reincarnating? 
not Anne, mm -hmm. but the, the, so, the bigger soul that's behind her. And that's mm -hmm. who I'm with now. But I see her. I know it's not the Anne I knew, but it is the being who is, who is, who, who made Anne in the world. And so how could I have a more intimate relationship with Anne than with mm -hmm. such an entity? And so I'm very comfortable with that. Very comfortable mm. with that. Do you think that there's the possibility that she could then not necessarily leave, but if she chose to reincarnate well, incarnate again, do you think that that connection that you have with her is permanent? Or is there the chance that she could then move on to another phase or another level or whatever she's in right now? That well, she you know, would get to the end of that. It's fascinating that you asked that question at this moment, because just before you started to talk, she said, you're going to talk about reincarnation. Oh, wow. And I do have some specific things to say. Not only is there a new being, a new, a new human being that has been projected by that soul, I know this child very well. It, it happens to be a child of, of friends of mine. And uh, they don't know. But what happened was uh, the child is two. And so it, uh, about six months before the child was born, two different psychics who do not, did not know each other then and don't know each other now, independently, sent me emails saying that they had heard from Anne and she was going to reincarnate. And she wanted me to know that and to know who it would be. And I do know, and it's a little boy and the little boy and I are very, very close. We're clo I'm closer to this child than I have ever been to any child in that age group. Uh, in my life, including my own my own child and my grandchildren, and wow. uh, and I accept it completely. I'm glad of this. This is a wonderful thing that has happened, and the soul that the great soul that projected Anne into the world, and now this new child, and I are still dear friends. But it's she's not Anne anymore, or he's not Anne anymore. No. Mm. But yet you can still communicate with Anne. With the soul. Exactly and I, I, th could. I, I think of this as Anne, even though, as she yeah. said, I'm not Anne anymore, but I'll always yeah. be Anne for you. And that means that, that in order for me to understand her, her or the soul, I, 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 I communicate through the framework of Anne and the memories and life of Anne. This is a much bigger universe than we, we give it credit for. And we are much bigger than oh, we I think. Know. What's happening here is really something. And um, uh, uh, so, uh, yes, I am in that situation right now. And I have the new body in my life and love the little guy very dearly as a little boy. Uh, he's not he's not in any way Anne. he's not Anne. Yeah. but he is still part of that soul mm, mm. and so, so it's a new it's, it's a new kind of love as far as i'm concerned i don't think i've ever heard of it ever existing yeah. before yeah i've heard of stories where people believe that somebody is the incarnation of somebody else who was in their life earlier but there's never any way to prove it. You can never ask them unless that child has some kind of past life memory or pre-birth memory or something like that. There's absolutely no way we can prove it. No. And often children, I feel like they're very open and aware of spiritual things, but they're often shut down because they're children. They're too young to have any concepts or understanding. Yes. So how would we know? We wouldn't know. Well, the thing is knowing is is a funny thing. We wouldn't necessarily know in the context of Western, uh, the Western ideology of logic, I call it. Uh, but I know in my heart 
and that's powerful stuff too. Uh, and then there are other cultures in which it would be quite easy to know and people wouldn't think uh, twice about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in, and um, um, the, um, so yeah, I don't think unless the child for some reason would decide to say it or announce it in some way, mm. um, I don't see how how you could ever know. And I don't think we're really meant to know. I think in, in as far as I'm concerned, I will never say to this child or his parents anything. Fortunately, I know a lot of people with long, young children, so no mm. one hearing this <laughs> no could, could figure it out. <laughs> in any yeah. case, uh, I would never say to them or any of them anything about what I know or think mm. I know, because it's not mm. fair. Mm. It's not fair it's at not, all. It's not, because they're starting a different life. Yeah, have you been able exactly. To... Sorry. Go ahead. Have you been able to have any conversations around what that experience was like? What was it like for Anne to reincarnate? Or are you not able to get because it's in the new body? Or did she choose? So I get a lot of questions. Did she choose to incarnate in that specific body? Do we get to choose what happens to us? Well, it depends on who, who it is. It, you can, it depends on what kind of a life you've lived as to how much choice you have. Um, she could have gone on. She didn't need to reincarnate at all, but she did. And there's a larger aim there, which I'm not going to discuss. Uh, okay. that, it, that this life is, that, she's, that he is now living is intended to fulfill. Um, parts of this universe don't have the veil between the living and the dead that we do at all. And mm. I don't have it very much anymore, frankly. And I'm perfectly comfortable with this. I'm, I'm not uh, desperately sad that Anne no longer exists. Of course, mm. Anne no longer exists. Anne's dead. But the soul that created Anne does exist and is very much alive mm-hmm. and now has a new little one in the world to, to, uh, to, uh, 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 to draw forth in life. And at least one pretty fairly good guardian angel in that I'm, I don't have to just whisper from the background. I can actually sweep him up and, Pull him out from in front of any car he may happen to be in front of when I uh, am around, you know. So, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm very de- protective toward that child, and I've made sure that uh, there will be there will be things for him after I die uh, that will come to him. Mm. How do you feel about dying for you personally? Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm not, you know, I'm like a soldier. You know, when my when it's time for me to finish this work, then I'm done. I don't have any emotional content connected with dying at all. I'm going mm-hmm. to go through the process as efficiently as I can and make as much of my experience as I can, but I'm not even slightly afraid of it. I'm, you know, I, I, I hopefully I would, would prefer not to burn to death or something, but, you know, yeah. if, I, if, I, if I have a, a difficult death, I do. That's what you do when you come into into this level you have to accept the presence of chance mm, and mm. so as to when i will die i've sensed sometimes that i might be able to find that out but i mm. it's not something i i think would be helpful to know so i don't pursue it mm, i relate to that i don't particularly want to know any details i'm quite happy to to have that surprise me Mm, I find it interesting. A lot of near-death experiences, they go through phases where perhaps they look forward to death because they've had this beautiful glimpse into life beyond this world. Other people really struggle with that, so then they they don't necessarily look forward to dying. Looking forward to it sounds really morbid, doesn't it? But I'm always curious to find out people who have had these experiences or been around people with experiences, and yours is such an interesting one. I... I feel like we've opened up so many questions that could be out there. We've talked so much bigger than what I originally expected to. So Whitley Streber, I just have so enjoyed this. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. (laughs) 
Thanks for joining me for another episode of the Let's Talk Near Death podcast. Don't forget you can join the free online community over at www.letstalkneardeath.com and I look forward to sharing another episode with you soon.